Good morning, friends, and welcome to Wake Up in the Word. Thanks for joining me this morning. Well, as you can tell by the coffee cup, we're really getting ready to celebrate Christmas. It's in full gear now, and no better way to celebrate Christmas than to devotionally walk through the Gospel of John that talks about this greatest gift ever given to humanity, the Lord Jesus Christ. So come and join me and let's see what John chapter 3 has to say to us today. While we're getting there, though, I want to say thanks to the folks from Riverwalk Academy up there in Rock Hill that hosted us yesterday as we brought the boys from the First Baptist Crusaders up there, excuse me, the young men from the First Baptist Crusaders to play a basketball game. We had a great time. We didn't win the game, but we really enjoyed it, learned a lot about ourselves and each other, and uh, found out what it's like to demonstrate Christian character in the midst of the pressures of a game, where, you know, you have those who say that's a right call, a wrong call, and, you know, he pushed me the wrong way, and you want to retaliate. You know, sports is one of those venues in which you can learn in a microcosm some of the important strategies of life and what it means to live as a person of integrity. And hey, we're doing that pretty good with these guys on the basketball court. So thanks to Coach Ron, Coach West, to all the helpers, to Pam and all the parents that uh, helped everything happen last night. More games to come, y'all, and hopefully some with even a better outcome than the one last night. But we're in John chapter 3, and in John 3, we've just finished what could be arguably one of the greatest sermons preached of all time, that which Jesus does with Nicodemus. And amazingly enough, this great sermon, if you read it, it's laid out beautifully, perfectly, as a message, a sermon that could be preached anywhere. And remember, Jesus preached it to only one person. Yeah, preacher, if you're listening, uh, just remember that whether your audience is one or 100 or 1,000 or 10,000, the message is the same. Treat that one person as if they are the large congregation. You never know what an impact it'll have in the world. So listen, as we finish that message now, John the Apostle writes about the ministry of John the Baptist in a very important important conjunction here between the two ministries, that of John the Baptist and of Jesus' disciples. We begin in verse number 22 where it says, after this, Jesus and his disciples went to the Judean countryside where he spent time with them and baptized. John, who was also baptizing in Enon near Salem became uh, because there was plenty of water there, and people were coming and being baptized, since John had not yet been thrown into prison. So notice something about these early disciples of both Jesus and John the Baptist. They were baptizing. There is no doubt that the baptism they were using was one of immersion. They had to be in a place where there's plenty of water because this ceremonial dipping of someone into the water already demonstrated something that was foreshadowing what would happen to Jesus. It wasn't just splashing water on someone. It was demonstrating a complete and a total change. And for that to take place, the baptism was an immersion to demonstrate that totality. That same immersion, as Paul points out in Romans 6, would demonstrate the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Yes, that's why we Baptists and some other Christian denominations and groups are so adamant about baptizing the scriptural way, baptism by immersion. Well, but I digress. Then it says in verse number 25, then a dispute arose between John's disciples and a Jew about purification. So they came to John and told him, Rabbi, the one you testified about and who was with you across the Jordan is baptizing, and everyone is going to him. <laughs> They're kind of upset. It's kind of like, you know, the person that comes to you, pastor at church, and says, listen, the people that used to attend over here, uh, they're now going to this other church. It seems like it's caught on fire and revival's breaking out and now everyone's going over there. <laughs> and you're supposed to be disturbed over that. Why aren't they over here with us? And, and this happens all the time. You have to watch out for jealousy in the ministry. You'll be disturbed that all of a sudden your little group isn't as big as the next little group and there must be something wrong with them because of that. Or is there something wrong with you? 
You know, it reminds me of a time that was very special in my life when we started the Perimeter Road Baptist Church down there in Valdosta, Georgia. Some of you watching are from South Georgia and were part of that movement. And I thought it was interesting how some of my fellow pastors, when we were starting the little mission as a ministry of First Baptist Church out there in Northeast Valdosta, uh, that many of the ministers in the local association in the area would come pat me on the shoulder, God bless you, son, as you're struggling over there with that little mission. I know it's hard work, and, and they seemed very supportive. We're praying for you. It was an interesting change, though, as we became one of the fastest growing churches in the state, and as we began to past some of those other existing churches, some that had been around for 100 or 200 years, then all of a sudden attitudes change, not in everyone. I have some of my greatest friends in ministry to this day from folks I met during those years in Valdosta, but some just couldn't bear to think that our little mission church was now twice the size of theirs and growing while theirs was struggling. And all of a sudden, Stories started getting circulated about our church, things that were completely ludicrous and crazy. Oh, you know what kind of people they are? Oh, they must, they're growing too fast. They must be some kind of cult. And you know, I hear they do. And then you fill in the blank. And there's all kinds of stuff started circulating about us, all because these people were upset that suddenly our church was bigger than their church. Well, you know, the shoe's been on the other foot many times since then. I've worked in churches now where we're the smaller church and someone else is bigger and God's got his hand on that ministry. And am I supposed to talk badly about those folks? Now, hang on. If there's a genuine reason to talk badly about those people, then you need to tell the truth if you need to expose false doctrine or false teaching. But sometimes I find that it's really just ministry jealousy that drives some people to say bad things about other ministries. For the most part, I like to keep my mouth shut. I like to let God do the talking through his Holy Spirit and let folks who will dive into the word and know and understand it be able to discern for themselves whether a ministry is solid or not. Well, that's kind of what's going on here. John the Baptist's disciples now are upset. They're coming to John and they're saying, hey guys, listen, this Jesus, dude, he's baptizing more people than you are. More people are following him. I was just over there. The crowd is twice the size of our crowd. What are we going to do about it? So look what John says in verse 27. John responded, no one can receive anything unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the groom, but the groom's friend who stands by and listens for him rejoices greatly at the groom's voice. Now, what is this little statement about? It's about the typical Jewish wedding of the day in which it started by a central figure being the groom's friend who makes the announcements and the introductions and gets the wedding started. But then what does he do? He backs out of the way because the wedding now is about the bride and the groom. And so now it's about Jesus and what is going to be his church, the bride and the groom. John says, I'm the forerunner. I'm the friend that introduced him. I'm now backing out of the way. It's all about him now. So listen to what he says. You know, that last statement, the groom's friend who stands by and listens for him rejoices greatly at the groom's voice. Do you rejoice greatly at what's going on in other ministries besides your own? You should, because just like that basketball team that we had last night, we learned that these guys are not your competition. On the same, They're on the same team as you. You rejoice in the people on your team. You lift them up. You encourage them. So you missed that shot, but your friend made it. Rejoice with them because they made the shot, even if you didn't. You see, we need to encourage one another and lift one another up. As believers in Jesus Christ, we've got to recognize we're all on the same team. And that's what John was trying to tell his disciples. But this last statement is most important. And that's verse number 30, where he says, He must increase, but I must decrease. John realized that the platform wasn't going to be his much longer. 
John the Baptist had to point to Jesus because he's the Messiah. That means now it's time for the Messiah to take center stage, for him to get the attention. Yes, for him to be glorified. That means that many of those who had followed John, if they do what John expects them to do, they will be walking away from him and following Jesus. Now listen, friends, we've got to recognize that it's tempting even for some pastors to try to take center stage over the Lord they say they are promoting. As one megachurch pastor declared on stage, I am God, I am God. I'm sorry, sit back down up there in Charlotte. You are not God. It is the Lord you're supposed to be glorifying, not yourself. And you see, many times we who get caught up in, in ministry and get caught up in attention, all of a sudden think it's about us. My friends, it's not. It's about Jesus. Let's keep pointing people to him. Let's make sure that Jesus is glorified. He's the Lamb of God. We, when all else is, is laid aside and all the platitudes and the, oh, wow, I've got a bigger church than you do and all those comparisons, listen, ultimately, he is Lord. You and I are not. He must increase. We must decrease. Don't teach people to follow you. Teach them to follow Jesus. Well, God bless you. I'll see you again right here tomorrow as we wake up in the word and lift up the Lord who has saved us and will make a difference in our lives. It's he that we celebrate this Christmas season. Come join me in the celebration. God bless you. I'll see you then.